Greetings, friend. I'll show you how Simon Anthony solved this New York Times hard Sudoku puzzle by placing marks in the grid. I'll explain all the his Sudoku tips, tricks, and strategies as uh, he did it. I'll also include some positive video and what-if moments to help you analyze some alternate solve paths. Click on the link below if you want to try the puzzle yourself. And with that, it's solving time. Okay, first thing Simon marked was some threes here in block six. There's only two spots for a three right there. After marking these threes, he saw the ones coming across rows one and three and column uh, eight. So he was able to solve for a one right there in row two, column nine. And then notice, oh, well, hey, the ones and the threes now form a naked pair. Actually, it's a hidden pair. So he made this mark. So basically the ones and threes can only be in these two spots, so you can eliminate any other candidates from those two spots. And that's really powerful when you can find these kind of pairs. And they're very common in like a New York Times hard Sudoku. After that, he switched over and looked at the fives and noticed that there are two spots for five in block six. Um, in rows, uh, and then by doing that, he's able to solve for five up here in row three. So you see there's a five coming across row one, and then this fives are coming up column eight. Since this is a pointing pair of fives and they have to be in column eight in block six, uh, they can't be in these two spots. And so the only place left for a five is right there in row three, column seven. And in case you're wondering, these little marks down here, they're called Snyder notation. And what it means is when there's only two spots left in a block, you'll mark those two cannons. So like in this case, we marked the two fives. And so it's an easier way to notate very quickly. And once you solve one of these cells, you can quickly go back and solve the other cell for that candidate. Uh, Simon likes to use this quite a bit and he's kind of explaining this as he goes because a lot of his uh, viewers are pretty new to Sudoku. And so after solving the five, uh, he made, he marked the two fives remaining here in block two and then he goes down to block nine and notice there's only two spots for five down here because this pointing pair is still working hard to make sure there's not going to be any fives right there. And then he starts to kind of look at the block eight. Uh, and then he starts to look at how that affects the fives across column five. And so you see this is kind of like a wall of Sudoku here, right? And so now if we look up column five, where can a five be? Well, it can't be in row one because of this five. It can't be in row three because of this five. And it can't be in row six because of this five. So Simon sees there's only one place left for a five. And it's right there in row four, column five, which allows him to solve the five there in row five, column eight. Uh, then he switches his attention to the sixes and he finds uh, two spots for six in block six down here because we have the six coming across row four, but there's only two spots left here because these one and threes, it can't be at six right there. And now these sixes are become a pointing pair as well. So they're gonna come across here can't be any more sixes in any of these two spots. You have the six in row four, and you have a six coming down column two. So only two spots left for a six, so he makes those marks there in block four. What Simon says is that these three cells here, this wall in block eight is very powerful. So notice how the one comes down column four, and then also across row nine. And so it leaves only two spots for a one here in block eight, right? And so now you have these are now pointing pair coming up column six and the one come down there. There's only one spot left for a one here in block five. So he marks that one in row, five, uh, row six, column five, which allows him to immediately solve this one here in block six and also solve for that three in row six, column seven. Uh, he takes that and go, okay, you have a three here in row four and row six. So I can mark these threes there in block five. Um, then he changes his focus and finishes column five here. So there's only two spots left. So now you have a naked pair, right? And one of the two remaining candidates, well, it's a seven and a nine. So he marks a seven and the nine up there. Uh, and now the seven and nines can't be in any other spot here in block two, which is kind of helpful for us. Uh, and it allows him now to look down here at these twos and notice, okay, I have a two here in row three, row two. There's only one spot left for a two up here in block one. So he solves that for a two. Uh, then switch this focus to the sixes and notice, hey, I have a six here in row one, a row two, in column four, the seven and nine.
block the sixes right there in column five. So the only one place left for six in block two. Uh, you know, and the twos, Simon could have noticed this right off the bat. Uh, you know, those twos were there since the beginning of the puzzle. He just had started focusing on some other things down over here in, you know, block eight, block four, and five. Um, but you can see, you know, just always move around the grid and kind of see where else can you can solve. So after that six, he now is focused and says, oh, I have a three, seven coming up here in column three. So he's kind of scanning down the column and says, okay, well, the threes and sevens are only limited to two spots in block one. So this is another hidden pair. Uh, and so now there can't be any other candidates there. It just has to be a three or seven. So you really want to mark those when you find those. Uh, and so what remains, there's only two more candidates left. And so those candidates are four and eight. So you mark that as a naked pair. So four, eight, naked pair. Uh, then changes his focus to the ones. And then it says, oh, I solved this one here in row five and in row six. And there's a one coming down column two. And so this can be one right here in row four column one and with that he sees the ones in column one and two and he marks the ones down in uh, block seven there and then simon realizes oh well the fives are actually limited to the same two spots here in block seven so that's a hidden pair of uh, one five and so he makes that mark uh, then shifts his focus to the nines it's like oh the nines coming down column one this one five's right there there's only two spots left for a nine and so he makes that mark to notation. So you see, it's a combination of hidden pairs, pointing pairs, uh, you know, and, and just looking for naked hidden singles. And, and this will really get you through a puzzle pretty quickly. And this is what Simon's showing, and he's doing it quite well in this particular puzzle. In fact, he's going at a pretty slow pace, and a lot of the viewers really appreciated that, that he's kind of explained things as he went. All right, after marking those nines in block seven, he looks up to block four, and realizes only two spots for nine there. So he makes those marks. And now this brings us up to our first pause the video moment. So pause the video and see if you can solve for the six here in block four while I give you a few seconds. Okay, congratulations. If you spot it, you're getting really good at seeing these pointing pairs. And for those who just want to enjoy the show, the six is right here in row five, column three. And the reason being is you have the six coming down column two, one five right there. So that means the sixes have to be in these two spots here in block seven. So the sixes can't be there, they can't be there. And we knew there's gonna be one of these two spots because of this pointing pair of sixes. So we can solve for that row five, column three. So let's move on with our puzzle. So after solving that six in row five, column three, Simon marks the nine in row six, column three, and then notices uh, that the nines and the threes are in rows four and six. So you can make a hidden pair here of the threes and nines across uh, row five in columns four and six. Uh, then looks down and says, okay, I need to mark some sixes down here in block seven. So he marks those sixes there because only two spots here in block seven. And then he's looking at a row five again. He says, oh, okay, look, I have the six right here. What's left, a two and a seven? I see a two right there. So he can solve for the two in row five, column one. And then that means he can solve for the seven right here. And then he kind of uses his terms, I'm going to unwind it since the seven is able to solve these cells up here. So he, marks the seven up there in row three, column one, and then the three there in row two, column two. And with this three coming down and these threes in row seven and nine, there's only one place left for a three in block seven. So he's able to solve that for a three and then solve for the six in row seven, column one. And what Simon says, and he makes us know, is, hey, when you're adding a new number, now see what does that do and what kind of markings do you need to make as a result of that number? And Sudoku guy actually will make that comment as well. Like look left, look right, look up, look down, what you got? And you wanna look and see what you can mark. So he says, okay, I see a six here. Then I see a six here and he starts working his way across into block nine. There's only two spots for a six. So he marks those two spots for a six in block nine. Um, and now he's getting a little stuck here. And so Simon 
says, okay, I'm going to come back, and where I see just pairs, I'm going to make uh, marks. So now he's changing from Snyder notation to just mark it up to fill in finished pairs. But it really is Snyder since there's only two spots remaining for the four and for the eight there. Uh, but keep this in mind that sometimes the marks are for pairs, and sometimes they're just by by themselves, and sometimes it could be um, uh, just Snyder markings. So you have to keep track of that as a solver. Uh, then he kind of comes down and says, well, these fours are only limited to two spots now, so I'm going to mark that. Uh, these two spots are for four and block seven, because he's kind of looking for some restrictions now in block seven. Uh, after that, Simon looks for a while, and then he's able to find and solve uh, a hidden single. And it's a hidden single three across row three here. And he notices there's a three here, so it, can't, it can be a three. And this can't be a three, so he solves this for a three. And this brings us up to our first what if moment. So what if Simon didn't find this three? That wasn't really easy to find. He had to kind of change and shift gears there. What else could Simon have done to make some progress in this puzzle? And I'll show you that right now. So we'll take away, say he didn't see that three there. Uh, the next logical place he could have looked, instead of just looking at the three, is next door. Uh, in this cell, row three, column five. And remember, he made the seven nine marking he had solved the 7, so he could have been able to just solve the 9 right away and then solve that 7 right away. And then look and see what these 7s did. I have a 7 in row 1 and row 3. You come across, he could have solved this for a 7. And now you can kind of look at maybe a, a couple different options of what to do next. One thing might be to kind of look here and go, hey, there's a 4, 8, and 9 missing in block 3. I see the 4 and the 9 right there, so that's an 8. Uh, another thing he could have done is maybe focus on the threes now okay now i see three and a three so this has to be a three and then this is a nine and this is a three and you're going to make a lot more progress in this puzzle so there was a couple of ways to to see that and so you can see you know this is another method another way you could have made some progress so you always want to kind of look to what the marks are giving you and kind of look where you have the, the places of greatest restriction so let's go back to the main puzzle okay we're back to the original Solve, he didn't find this three here in row three, column four. And after that, uh, he noticed how it affected the threes here in block five. So he also solve for the three there in row five, column six. Uh, and of course, solve for the nine there in row five, column four. Then he noticed on the nines that uh, he had already solved for that seven. So he was able to solve for the nine there in row three, column five, and then finish up with the seven. So he kind of got back to what I had showed previously of going with the nines and the sevens up here because there was some solving to do up here in blocks two and three um, after the seven row in column five he then actually looks for the nines and so it sees nine nine and nine and solves for a nine in row one column seven and then finds that seven i talked about before the row two column eight um, and takes his focus down at the sevens and those are only two spots for seven down here in block nine. Um, and what Simon is noticing here is like, hey, this is a naked triple, five, six, seven, right? The limit of these three spots. But what you notice is this is a hidden pair of five and seven, right? The five and sevens have to be in one of these two spots. So the six can't be there. Simon makes a note of that. So if you ever see this kind of notation when you're doing your Snyder, you know that this is gonna overrule, these, this hidden pair is gonna overrule any other markings you have, and you can remove those marks. So he's able to solve the sixth then for row eight, column eight. Uh, and after that, that's disambiguated these sixes up here. So he solved for that six, row six, column nine. Um, then finish up naked pair marking for block six with the twos and the eights. Uh, after that, it's all this eight is now kind of a pointing pair. So there's only one spot left for an eight up here in block three. So they can mark that for an eight in row and column nine. Um, he then finished up with this four here in row three, column eight. Uh, then went and Simon saw, okay, I got the four here. I can disambiguate these fours and eights. So he solved for the four and solved for the eight there. Uh, looked up and saw that this is, you know, full house, only spot remains. So when you get to this part of solve, you really want to look for these biggest restrictions. And I'll put a link to my all the single cell solving uh, methods right here and so you can check that out and kind of just if you want to get better at this part of the cleanup of the puzzle 
um, you can it, this will help you kind of see where to go next and the big thing is go where there's the biggest restrictions look for the full houses look for the pairs and then that will get a lot of solving for you and you have to do less marks and it's kind of an easier quicker solve for you all right after getting that four in row one column six he then made a mark for fives and eights to finish off that block uh, then started and focused on the nines. Oh, I got the nine here and a nine here. There's only one spot left for a nine down here and block nine. So he kind of worked his way up to here. Then he went right back down to see what else he could do. So he solves that nine. Uh, then cuts across and says, okay, I got a nine here. I had made some nine markings over here in block seven. So I can solve that for a nine. Row eight, column two. That's how the Snyder really gets and becomes valuable because you can get to another solve pretty quickly by doing that. Uh, then... And there's only one spot left for a nine in block eight, and so he solves this nine in row nine, column six. And he says, Oh, I feel like this puzzle is really close to cracking. And you know, if you're looking at it, yeah, it's getting close. So then he looks and he keeps his markings going. First, he looks at the twos and where can they go in block nine, and then he looks at the fours and where they can go in block nine. So that you know, you have one, two here, and you have one, four there. So he makes those marks for the twos and the fours, but then notices hey i got this four coming down there's only one spot left for a four here in block five so he's able to mark and solve for that four and then this is seven coming right here he's able to solve for seven and then he can finish up block five by marking that two which disambiguates the two and the eight over there in block six uh then he comes over and notices uh that i could solve and finish up block Four. So he gets that four and he gets that eight right there. And now, since he has the eight here, now he can move on down to block seven and he can solve for the four in row nine, column one. And he made this mark for the eight there in row seven, column two. And then he marked the eights over here in block nine. But this brings us up to our second what if moment. Uh, what if Simon didn't make any marks here? Could you just solve the rest of this puzzle without making any marks? And I'll show you that right now. So if you didn't make any marks there, when you're getting, and you can see how there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, there's 14 cells remaining. Uh, you could probably solve this without making the marks. First thing you notice is that four right here, you could be able to solve for that for a four. And then that would be able to be able to solve for a two right here. You got the five, seven, and you'd be able to solve for an eight. So all that could have been made easily without any marks. Then you could solve this for a five, solve this for an eight, solve that for a five. And I think from here, you'll notice that you could get through the rest of this puzzle pretty easily without making any more marks. And I would start with this two coming across row eight and down column six. But let's go back to the main solve because that's what I want to show you. So Simon did notice, uh, you know, these eights right here. He marked those in blocks, nine rows, uh, eight, nine, column seven. But then he did notice that four, and so he solved for the four, row seven, column seven, um, and went down and solved for the eight in row nine, column seven, and the two for row eight, column seven. I and mean, like I said, uh, he didn't have to make those marks to do that. He kind of kind of followed the path that I had showed you before. Uh, next thing he looked for was. this two like i said come across row eight and then down column six so you'll solve for that two in row seven column four and then the five and row nine column four which is what i kind of noticed as well and you can come up here and simon likes to solve the other digit like the like he doesn't come here and solve the eight he'll solve the five and then the eight and that's kind of peculiar but it's kind of cool uh you know he kind of sticks on the same digit and it moves to the other digit I find that interesting. Um, so he solved for that eight in row two, column four, and then went down, and there's only one place left for an eight here in block eight, so he's able to solve that eight in row eight, column six. Um, switch is focused into the ones, and he, he kind of noticed, all right, this is a full house, so there's only one place left for a one in row seven, column six, which helps him solve and finish off block seven with the one and the five there, which helped him finish off the five and seven over here in block nine. So he solved those. And then the last digit he solved was in row eight, column four, which was a seven. Check out these other 
analysis videos where I look at some more of Simon's puzzles. Don't forget to buy me a coffee link. Thank you so much for watching.